Hello and welcome to the fragrant world of natural perfumery. I'm Melanie Jane and I'm really excited to take you on this aromatic journey through fragrance. So let's get started. This is called a certificate in natural perfumery and why natural perfumery? Basically because it's the easiest thing to learn when it comes to naturals. You'll be familiar with some of the smells already like rose or clove or cinnamon. So you'll already know about them and for you to start a journey into perfumery it's important that you understand and you learn about the naturals before you learn about aroma chemicals and this is what perfumers do. They have to learn about 3,000 different ingredients but they'll always start with the naturals. I've split all the modules into lessons just to make it easier for you to learn and it's more digestible so that after each lesson you can go on and uh, do some further self-studying. So let's have a look at the outline and what we're going to be covering in module one. We're going to be looking at what perfume is and why things smell. We'll be briefly looking at the history and evolution of perfume, the significance of the olfactory system, We'll be looking at perfume ingredients and the various extraction methods. We'll be doing a personality quiz linked to fragrance preference. That's my favourite part. We'll be looking at the significance of perfume themes, the intoxicating perfume triangle, of course, and a journey through the fragrance families and smelling and looking at natural oils from around the world and profiling them. I'll be showing you smelling techniques. We'll be building your olfactory language along the way. We'll be looking at the pre-dilution of oils, the why and the how, and learning how to weigh your ingredients because that's how um, you have to learn in perfumery. We don't use drops, we use weight. So I hope that you've got your scales with you. Uh, the dilution of the oils and the weighing ingredients is going to be in a instructional video with me. And I'll be showing you how to train your nose like a pro and how to detect the differences between similar oils. And then understanding the impact of oils, this is a really important thing. We'll be talking about accords, what they are, and how to build them, and the different types of accords that you have in perfumery. And at the end of module one, I'll be asking you to submit your accord formulas, not the actual accord, but just the formulas via email, just for evaluation from me, so I can give you some feedback. And after that, then I will be giving you access to module two. I'll give you access to module two about two weeks after you've got access to module one. It's because I just want to make sure that you're learning at a correct pace. Before we get started, this is quite important, and I'll be very, very brief. There's something called on the internet, if you go on YouTube, there's quite a few lectures about it, and it's called mind mapping. What a lot of people do when they come to my lectures, they try to write down every single thing I say. They try to write down every sentence, every phrase. And then what happens is they're like, oh, what was that? Why is everybody laughing? What did they say? What did she say? Because they're not listening. They're trying to just write everything down. And that's not the way that your brain works. Your brain doesn't remember whole sentences and it doesn't remember whole paragraphs. What it remembers is images. It remembers emotions and feelings. It remembers key words and images. So if you have a look at a typical mind map, there's a gentleman called Tony Buzan and he invented the mind map and he's got a website, imindmap.com. You can go and have a look on there and get a little bit more explanation about it, but it's an easier way to document. So when I'm going through the slides and I'm talking, I want you to have your plain paper pad with you and a pen or a pencil and use different color pencils as well. That's what I like to do because remember your brain remembers colors and images more than it will whole sentences and it'll trigger then something. It'll trigger a memory in you to go, ah, oh, rose, pink, soft, 36 roses to make one drop of oil, you know, and little things like this, if you're just writing keywords and even drawing pictures, you can do that. It makes it easier for you to remember, plus you're not having to write down all of these sentences. And what will happen is those keywords will actually trigger what I actually said in the lecture and you'll almost remember what I'm actually, what I've actually told you. So try to do this rather than doing whole sentences as I'm going and narrating, because we're going to be talking about lots and lots of things. And I just want you to be able to remember it in a structured way and an easy way. So that's enough about mind mapping. Let's go on to perfume. What is perfume? 
The word perfume comes from the Latin perfumus, which means through smoke. And this is how they used to burn the perfumes in, in the 18th, 17th, even the 12th century. Um, they would burn them in the streets, perhaps um, when they were used to have sewers running through the streets and things like that, they would burn it. And it was a traditional way of burning um, the raw materials, you know, people still do it nowadays with sage and frankincense and they create this smoke. So that's what perfume means. But perfume is communication. It's a very, very important thing. Perfume is a way to, it makes you feel. It's like music. It evokes emotions. It makes you feel something whether that something is a good thing or a bad thing, but it evokes emotions, doesn't it? When you smell something, it can make you happy, it can make you sad, it can make you reminiscent, and it can change the way that you feel as well. So it's very much like emotion, but people choose perfume based on the personality and the image that they want to portray. Mood and occasion also plays a part. But perfume is a part of your identity. It increases your footprint on the world. There's 8 billion people or more on this planet, and we're such a tiny little speck on it, really. So it's increasing your footprint in the, on the world, and it shows the world who you are as a person. It's showing who are you, who is Melanie Jane. And, you know, so it, it's reflecting to the world who you are as a person, and perhaps portraying some part of your personality and maybe even a hidden part of your personality as well. So it's a very important thing, perfume. Think about other things that portrays your image to the world. Your clothes, your shoes, bags, I have lots of those, your car, can do, your house, your career, your jewellery, even the watch that you wear. So these things, to a lot of people, portray maybe just one of them, maybe just two of them, maybe all of them. But this is portrays your image to the world as a whole. And perfume is also a part of that. It's a part of your image. But perfume also reflects how you want to feel. How you might particularly feel on that day, or how you want to feel. If I want to go into the office and I want to feel really powerful and strong because I'm going into a meeting with lots of men and I'm the only woman, you know, I want to feel powerful. So I'm not going to wear a girly, powdery, flowery perfume. I'm going to wear something that's got some impact, you know, and it's going to make me feel powerful that day. That's the importance of perfume as well. And a lot of people underestimate it's not just about a nice smell. Let's have a look at what an aroma is and why do some things smell? Pick up something on your desk now. Pick up a piece of paper, perhaps even a tin can, or a plastic bottle, or an artificial flower, or a piece of paper. What is an aroma and why do some of these things that you're picking up not smell? If you have a photo frame in front of you, pick it up and smell it. Why does it not smell? It's because they don't have volatile molecules. Volatile molecules evaporate and are light enough to be transported into your olfactory system. They say that a molecular weight of 300 or less is considered a light enough molecule to evaporate off the object and then work its way into your olfactory system so that you can actually smell it. And that's why some things have no smell, like gold. Now we're going to go on and we're going to have a look at the evolution of perfume. Dating back to at least 3000, the ancient Egyptians burned incense as offerings to their gods and fragrance was associated with superior powers and the offerings were performed to appease these superior powers. Now, something that's very interesting is a lot of people talk about oh, essential oils, and essential oils date back to 3000 BC. That's not true. In those days, there was no distillation method. They didn't know how to get, um, or they didn't even know that it was even possible then, to get oil out of a plant. So they would use the actual plants um, uh, themselves, and they would burn them, and however 
you know, they would grind them up and they would use them as part of their beauty treatments as well as offering them and also to be able to smell beautiful um, and in beautifying rituals. But what they wouldn't do is use essential oils. In 1872, a papyrus scroll was actually found and it measured almost 20 meters. And this scroll contained how perfumes, cosmetics and ointments and balms were actually produced in ancient Egypt. So imagine that they had recipes in those days and this scroll was about 20 meters long. And if you go to Germany, to the Leipzig University Library uh, in Germany, you can go and have a look at this scroll. It's actually on display. So that's quite fascinating. That's on my to-do list. And also um, a grave carving was found dating back to 600 BC, which showed how lilies were made into perfumes. In 700 BC in ancient Greece, the art of perfume making is thought to have begun in Crete. And in 500 BC, the Arabians, they developed a thriving frankincense trade. Demand was so great that the trade route was known as the frankincense trail. And it was around the Arabian Gulf, around the Persian Gulf. And then it extended, because demand was so great in the frankincense trail, um, it actually then extended to the Mediterranean. And we're going to talk about frankincense. But this, as you can see, is the frankincense tree. On the right, you can see this is the, the bark of the actual tree. And this is where the resin of the frankincense comes from. And when we start to talk about oils, I'll talk to you more about frankincense. Um, on the bottom left here, you can see this is the actual dried resin. So what they do is they actually tap the tree. It's a very thin papery bark on the frankincense tree and they tap it and you get these tears that fall down and they'll dry on the tree, they'll fall to the ground and then they will collect them. They'll wait till they're dry. They collect them and then they put them into caves for about three months to dry. And then they'll either distill them to make an essential oil or they'll keep them as a resin and burn them. In 41 BC, of course, we all know about Cleopatra and uh, she was thought to have used scented oils to seduce Mark Antony. In 1 AD, the Romans used bathing as a ritual and fragrance played a huge role. And even the Emperor Nero used to spray his dinner guests with rose water in between courses. I'm not sure I'd like to be at that dinner party. <laughs> in 8 AD, burning incense again became popular in churches because burning it, you know, lost popularity throughout the ages, but it became popular again in a lot of the Catholic churches and a lot of the higher Anglican churches. And that's why when a lot of people smell frankincense, one of the descriptive words that they use is it smells like a church. In the 12th century in Venice, um, this was a key city not a lot of not a lot of people know about and it played a key role in the perfume industry for a few hundred years. In fact, they actually say that perfumery came from Italy into France and it didn't originate in France and they used to walk down the streets and the streets were filled with sewerage so what they would do is they would hold bouquets of flowers even under their noses to cover the stench in the streets. In the 16th century the first alcohol-based perfume was created for Queen Elizabeth of Hungary and this included rosemary this is the first recipe, real recipe, that's been found that was created by a hermit for Queen Elizabeth of Hungary. And it was such a simple recipe. It was literally rosemary infused in alcohol wine. That was it. We've come a long way since then. If you look at the 17th century, grass is Europe's hub for cultivating perfume ingredients. They used to use fragrance and they cultivated fragrances, but they would use that fragrance for perfume gloves because the main industry in grass was the tanning industry. So they would make gloves, but then they would use the fragrance to perfume the gloves so that when they were walking down the streets, as I said before about the stench in the streets, you know, and sewerage problems that they would always have in those days. 
um, and they would put their gloves in front of their face to cover the stench. Louis XIV actually commissioned perfumers to make a new fragrance for every single day of the week. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? In the 18th century, Marie Antoinette was so extravagant that she had her own personal perfumer. I wouldn't mind that. And in the Victorian era, remember there were no synthetic materials in these days. They were all naturals. And nice, inverted commas, women were expected to smell like roses and delicate florals. And perfumes were only made, like I said, using natural ingredients. So that's how it was in the Victorian era. And it's quite different today. In the 19th century now, the tanning industry really has gone because the establishment of the perfume industry, grass became central and it's known now as the city of flowers. This is where I studied and this is a very fa famous perfumery, uh, Fragonard, and you can go in there, they've got a museum, I think you can go and have a little class in there as well. It's quite interesting. It's about 30 miles from Nice and it's a beautiful city and it is central now and they don't do, they don't have the tanning industry anymore. It's all about perfumery. At the end of the 19th century, this was a real milestone in perfumery because coumarin, which is a, um, a sub substitute for tonka bean, and vanillin, which is a substitute for vanilla. Now, tonka bean and vanilla are notoriously very, very expensive. And we'll talk about why things are expensive later on. But coumarin and vanillin are great substitutes for tonka bean and vanilla because it now means that People who are not so affluent can afford beautifully expensive smelling perfumes. And at the end of this 19th century, indeed, Guerlain launched the first perfumes that blended naturals with synthetics. And Guerlain is still one of the best perfume houses in the world. They have their own in-house perfumers so that they can't create for anybody else. The same with Chanel and the same with Hermes. In the 20th century, Coty introduced perfume to the masses. So this is when it started to get really popular and it's one of the biggest perfume houses today. This is one of my favorite stories in all of my classes. I always tell this story. We all know about the Chanel number no. five. It was actually launched in 1921. So in a couple of years, it's going to be a hundred years old and I can't wait for that year. That'll be exciting amazing i can't imagine what they're going to do uh yeah but basically chanel number no. five is the result of a mystery a mistake sorry it made history when a perfumer added 10 times more aldehyde to the recipe after his finger slipped now nobody knows if it was the perfumer or if it was his apprentice but Coco Gabrielle Chanel loved it so much that they kept it. So this is why I tell all my students, when you're making a perfume and you make a mistake, don't throw it away. It might be the best mistake you've ever made. Because now Chanel number no. 5 is the most iconic fragrance of all time. And it was the result of a mistake. So don't be afraid of making them. Uh, the 1970s was a very important time when it came to perfumery. Uh, I love this uh, advert here. Uh, it's where women were expressing their liberation and uh, marketing. Revlon got right on there with the Charlie perfume. I used to have a bottle of this. <laughs> yeah, so I was born in the 70s. So yeah, I mean, this is how perfume evolves through the decades now. And I'm going to show you how it starts to change. We're going to look at the 80s now. So this was about women's liberation and women becoming more popular and more equal to men. But then if you look at the 1980s, this was the era of the room rocker power perfumes like opium and poison, Shalimar, very, very powerful. And some American restaurants actually banned the perfumes and, um, in, in their restaurants because they thought that the intensity of the perfume would spoil the enjoyment of the other people that were eating around them. Such was the strength of the perfumes. And these were typical oriental perfumes. But this was an era of where women were, you know, they were like 
I'm here, I matter, and I'm powerful. And remember, the, was it the Working Girl movie with Melanie Griffith and she had the big shoulder pads? So yeah, that was really interesting. And uh, yeah, power women and shoulder pads and dynasty in Dallas, you know. So yeah, it's a great time for perfume in the 1980s. There were some amazing ones and very, very iconic perfumes made. And I think perfumers became very, very bold about what the ingredients that they were putting in them women did not need to know they didn't need to smell like a nice lady anymore but then if we look again now another decade later we look at iconic fragrances like CK1 and Izzy Mayaki these heralded a return to then unisex fragrances it was all about cleaner fresher crisper scents because if we look about 120 years ago perfumes were unisex there was no men's perfume or women's perfume men wore floral perfumes all the time there was no divide and the 1990s went back to this although they weren't so floral they would, they would use very light very fresh florals but it was a lot about cleaner fresher crisper scents and a lot of aroma chemicals were used in these because you'll find a lot of fresh scents in aroma chemicals this is one of my favorite things now. Frederick Marle has launched, and he comes from a family of perfumers. He launched a range of perfumes that displays the names of the noses on the bottles. This is now lifting the veil of secrecy that once shrouded the geniuses behind perfume creations. Nobody knew who created Chanel Number no. 5 when it was created. They probably thought that Coco created it. But what's happening now is if you have a look at the bottle to the left, it says Jean-Claude Eleanor. Now, Jean-Claude Eleanor, he's actually left Hermes now, but he was the exclusive perfumer for Hermes. So he couldn't create fragrances for anybody else. And what happens is when you're looking at perfumers, have a look at, um, you know, Armani and Boss, Estee Lauder even, they commission perfume houses to make fragrances for them. And that perfumer that makes a fragrance for Armani or Hugo Boss or Victoria's Secret, that same perfumer will make a perfume for your hand wash or your hand sanitizer or your shower gel or your fabric conditioner. But Hermes, Chanel and Guerlain had their own in-house perfumer so that they couldn't create for anybody else. And that's why they're so expensive and that's why they're so beautiful um, and also because they have a lot of raw natural ingredients in them and very high quality but what's happened with this line now from Frederick Marle is he went to the perfumers and he said create the perfume that you have always wanted to create because perfumers are always creating things for other people even Jean-Claude Eleanor he was creating fragrances for Hermes but he wasn't creating the fragrance that he wanted to create. He was creating a fragrance that Hermes wanted him to create. And they would give him a brief. Some of these briefs are over 100 pages long. So, yes, if you look at that. So he went to these uh, master perfumers and said, don't create for anybody else. Create the perfume that you, your whole life, have dreamed of creating and selling to the public. And they did just that. And he has this range of amazing fragrances. It's the perfume that they've always dreamed of. And they're now for sale. And now these guys and girls are getting recognition, finally. I love this quote by Helen Keller. Smell is a potent wizard that transports you across thousands of miles and all the years you have lived. The olfactory system is a very powerful thing. It derives from the Latin officer, which means to smell. And if you can see, the aromatic, the volatile aromatic substances that are getting into your nasal cavity, they're going and touching your olfactory bulb. Your olfactory bulb is about the size of a postage stamp and it's in between your eyebrows. And it links to the limbic system of the brain. The limbic system of the brain is the most primitive part of your brain and it's linked to the most primitive emotions and feelings like um, hunger and thirst and fear and sex. 
The nose is the only open pathway that leads directly to our brain. Fragrance has a direct impact on our most primitive behaviors and emotions. And it does. Even when you smell, you must, everybody, I've never met a single person that hasn't come across some type of smell and it's instantly reminded them of something. I remember I was in a bed and breakfast in France a couple of years ago with my husband and I was washing my hands with a hand wash that had neroli essential oil in it. And as I was smelling it, I instantly, the smell of this hand wash instantly took me back 12 years to a hotel room in New York where I fell in love with my husband. It was our first holiday together. That is the power of the olfactory system. But fragrance can also have a direct impact on your most primitive behaviors. So it can make you feel sad, it can make you feel upset, it can make you feel nauseous depending on the actual fragrance. It can make you feel a little bit angry or anxious, but it can make you feel happy and reminiscent and joyful as well. So it's a very, very powerful thing is fragrance. And did you know that your sense of smell is actually 15% more powerful than your sense of sight when it comes to recalling memories? And your olfactory bulb and your limbic system, the, the olfactory system is linked to long-term memories. So that's why it's very good at recalling actual long-term memories. If you smell something, it might remind you of your grandmother who you used to visit 35 years ago or something. If I smell mothballs, it reminds me of my grandmother. Um, yeah, and takes me back literally 35 years. Humans have 50 million receptor cells in their olfactory bulb. Bloodhounds have 300 million. Hence the reason their sense of smell is so acute. So now we're going to move on to perfume ingredients. In perfumes, you will get the following. Ethanol alcohol at 96%. Some people use perfumers alcohol that's been denatured. Uh, you will find antibacterial agents, uh, fixatives sometimes, and conditioning agents. You might all, not always use alcohol ethanol. You might uh, prefer to make a perfume and put it in an oil. And that's fine, but what um, I am not going to talk about through any of these modules is these ingredients. I'm only going to be discussing the following, and we call them perfume compounds, or otherwise known as raw materials. So the raw materials, and you'll find this a lot, this phrase a lot in perfumery, raw materials. And they are compounds, otherwise known as raw materials, but not soluble in water, but fully dispersible in alcohol and carrier oils like jojoba. So what are these raw materials? Well, one of the first ones is essential oils. An essential oil is derived from the aromatic part of a plant processed to be a pure aroma substance. Now, how many species of plants do you think there are in the world? There's tens and tens of thousands, aren't there? But there's probably only around 300 naturals, or maybe 300 perhaps, to up to 500 perhaps, of plant materials that's used, natural plant materials that's used in perfumery or aromatherapy. And that's because a lot of the other plants, they don't smell. They don't have an aromatic part. Or if they do, then sometimes it's too difficult to actually extract it. But that's what an essential oil is, and it's coming from the aromatic part of the plant. And whatever part that is, it varies from plant to plant. We're going to talk about that. Another one is an absolute. This is also an oil extracted from the plant, from the aromatic part of the plant, or the flower, but it's taken by solvent extraction or enfleurage, an essential oil is actually steam distilled and we're going to get into the extraction methods now. But first let's have a look at natural isolates. Natural isolates are extracted from essential oils. They're more powerful, they have more punch, uh, they're more costly, but they're also more stable. And when I talk about being stable, I'm talking about when it's coming to 
when you're making perfumes um, for the mass market, a lot of people prefer to use essential oils because they're more complex. The natural aroma, for instance, of rose consists of three major components, geraniol and citronella. You'll hear it a lot and you'll see it a lot on ingredients for fragrances um, or for cosmetics even. But for simplicity, what we're going to do is we're going to call them smell molecules. And that we're going to get into that a little bit later. If we look at synthetic molecules now, this is another compound that you can find in perfumery. And they're otherwise known as aroma chemicals. They're completely man-made. They're syn and typical synthetics are so strawberry, chocolate, caramel, leather, gooseberry, lots of things like that. There's lots of flowers that you'll find as well that are not, so for instance, gardenia, um, honeysuckle, carnation, tulip. These are synthetics. The flowers, um, a lot of the flowers, tulips, don't even really have a fragrance and neither does a carnation, not really. Um, so it's something that's deduced to smell almost like one of those flowers. So yeah, they'll be completely synthetic. So those are the kind of compounds that we get in perfumes, essential oils, absolutes, natural isolates and aroma chemicals. So let's have a look at which part of the aromatic plant is used. So geranium, this surprises some people because geranium people know about them. They're the cheap little plants that you can find and people put them all around their gardens and they have them in hanging baskets, especially in England. Everybody used to have them hanging outside their door. Um, and patchouli, well this comes from the leaves, the aromatic part of the plant. Patchouli has little purple flowers as well, but they're not the aromatic part of it. The aromatic part of it is the leaves. Then we'll look at typical uh, flowers, a lavender and rose. For ginger and vetiver, the aromatic part of them comes from the roots. Carrot seed and nutmeg, that comes from the seeds, of course. Cinnamon and sandalwood, it's bark. And this is very easy, I think, for you to learn which part is used because it makes kind of common sense, apart from maybe the leaves. Uh, resin, yeah, so you've got frankincense, you've got different kinds of resins, we will go through those when we have a journey through the families. And the peel, so typically citrus fruits, bergamots, lemons, oranges, limes, mandarins, so the aromatic part, that will actually come from the peel. So let's have a look now at the extraction process. The extraction process is called such because we need to extract the oil from this aromatic part of the plant. So how do we do it? Well, let's talk about, first of all, steam distillation. This is the most common and the most popular way of actually getting aromatics out of plant materials. So if you have a look at the vat here, it's the most widely used method. Uh, the harvested flowers and leaves are placed, if you have a look, in this steel tank here. They're suspended over boiling water and they're steamed, much like steaming vegetables, I like to, con I like to think about it. Um, the container is closed with a pipe running from it into a vat and when the steam travels through the pipe, it's rapidly cooled, which then condenses into water. And because oil and water don't mix, the two separate with ease in the vat and the oil is taken from the tap and the water from the bottom. So here you can actually see that once it's gone through and the aromatic part of the plant is being pushed. And remember we talked about the molecules, how they're light. So they get pushed through here into this coil. The cold water condenses them, they fall into here. And what are you getting is you're getting a hydrosol or, or otherwise known as a floral water. And then on the top here, you'll see the essential oil. This was my trip to a lavender distillery, actually, and this was very nice. And it's, it's funny when you go as well, because you expect it to be like, you know, men in white coats in clinical labs, uh, but it's not, it's very organic. Um, and you always, you will find the distillery at the same place as where they actually have and grow and harvest the flowers, the lavender, jasmine or rose, quite often, not always. 
So these are the vats where you actually put uh, the plant material. You can see the pipes where the steam will go through. This was our guy at the Lavender Distillery in Provence. He was hilarious. I wanted to take a picture of the vats, but he thought I wanted to take a picture of him, so he just stood there. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very nice. But can you see this? So this is the tap here where they will actually get the essential oil from because it's floating at the top here, you see. Then all of this is the water. And then this is the end product now that you can actually see. So at the top here, you can see the oil. At the bottom is the water. And the water is actually a, um, essentially a waste material, but it's one that's got mild healing properties of the essential oil. So I like to use floral waters on my face. Some people drink it. Uh, it can be refined. If you see rose water in the supermarket, it's food grade because you can see here it's cloudy because it's still got some of the waxes and things like that from the plant material. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's how people, they use it as a face mists and things like that. So it's uh, it's very nice. And it's nice to use on infants as well, uh, the, the actual floral water, because you can't use essential oils on children. And lavender and chamomile water are one of my favorite things if you want to spray them on a maybe a cranky infant or something like that. So let's have a look at other extraction methods now. Expression. This is a technique um, similar to olive oil and it's citrus fruits, um, such as grapefruits, lemons, limes and oranges. And it's pressed from the peels and the seeds, sometimes, not always. And as you can see, it's got this conveyor belt here. You've got the lemons, they're going up the conveyor belt. And it's got this little corkscrew rasper. And it's basically squeezing out the oil. If you get an orange now, if you have an orange handy or a lemon, just give it a squeeze and you'll be able to see the oils coming out actually from the peel. So this is when an essential oil is actually an oil. All the other essential oils that are steam distilled from flowers and leaves, etc., and bark, they are not an actual oil. It's an aromatic isolate. But citrus oils actually are oils. So then you can see then we just, uh, we've got the oil here and it just gets separated. So that's your citrus fruits expression. Then we've got solvent extraction. This is used a lot as well. Um, this method is used on very delicate flowers like jasmine and rose, also vanilla. It's used for a couple of reasons. It's used because the heat from distilling jasmine, like you'll never find a jasmine essential oil. You'll never find a tuberose essential oil because the heat from distilling it would actually destroy the fragrance and destroy the flower first before you're able to get the fragrance out of it. So that's one reason that solvent extraction is used. Another reason it's used is because it creates a different aroma profile. So like we just talked about lavender being steam distilled, but you can actually solvent extract it. And if you do, it's got a completely different profile aroma wise. It's got a richer body for lavender, for instance. Natural lavender is quite high in camphor. If you look at lavender, because it's so high in camphor, people don't want to put this aspect into a perfume. So if they solvent extract the plant, the camphor is no longer present. So it's a deeper, richer, and the actually absolute lavender or lavendin is actually preferred by the perfume industry more than the actual essential oil, which is used in aromatherapy. Let's look at enfleurage. This isn't really used these days. It's a very old traditional method of extracting flowers. It was pioneered in the 17th century France and it's used to extract the fragrance from flowers that don't give up their scent very easily, like lily or tuberose. So what they would do is the fresh petals were soaked in animal fat and continuously replenished until the fat is completely saturated with the fragrance. The fat is then washed with alcohol to capture the perfume and then the alcohol is vacuumed off or evaporated and what you're left with then is this beautiful aromatic absolute. This method is very very rarely used these days but it's still practiced in Tahiti on the highly fragrant tiar flower and they use coconut oil 
by soaking the petals. And I know that some people can use shea butter as well to be able to get it. And then what you can do is that you can use this fat that's still got some of the fragrance that's left over from the whole process and you can put it in a pomade. And that's what they used to do traditionally. They would put it in the pomades around the house and they smell absolutely fabulous. I've got a couple from flea markets. Robertette is a fragrance manufacturer and they harvest a lot of raw materials and they only deal in naturals. Uh, Robertette, their headquarters are in France um, and they still use this method today and they use it just for the tuberose. Tuberose notoriously does not give up its scent very easily. In fact, I visited a jasmine farm in, in France in Grasse and they had a jasmine farm but next to the jasmine farm was a little tuberose patch and it was a very very small patch and they just had these single stalks of the tuberose and they didn't use to extract the oil from them at all they would grow them and simply sell each single stalk for five euros to the local florists then we're going to look at co2 extraction this is carbon dioxide and it's used to extract the aromatics from plant materials instead of steam so it's a process that uses pressurized carbon dioxide to pull the desired phytochemicals from a plant and at certain temperatures the pressure acts like a solvent without the dangers of actually being one. The beauty of this method and the CO2 quickly and completely evaporates leaving no residue. So in the solvent extraction process you've got there um, residue from the solvents. Now it's parts per million, it's very 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 minute but one of the reasons why they don't use um, absolutes in aromatherapy. But the beauty of the CO2 extraction is it has an aroma that's closer to the natural plant than a steam distilled essential oil because it hasn't been damaged or anything by any of the heat. This is really interesting when we're talking about raw materials. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, why does rose cost so much and why does jasmine cost so much? It's because the oil yield in the actual plant part, like in the petal or the leaves or the bark, the oil yield is so low that you have to use so much material to get out a certain amount of essential oil. So I'm going to show you some examples now. Neroli, you need a thousand kilograms of neroli flowers to make just one kg. That's why neroli is one of the most expensive oils. Rose, 700 kilos at least. It could be up to a thousand as well, depending. It takes around 36 roses to make a single drop of rose essential oil. When you look at jasmine, you need around 700 kilos. Bergamot, a thousand kilos. Orange, 1700 kilos. But remember, this is the oranges we're looking at. The roots for vetiver, you need about 75 kilos. So you can see the yield there is quite high. Cedarwood, 30 kilos. Patchouli, 25 kilos pine needles 500 kilos that's a lot of pine needles and uh, myrrh resin it's about 20 kilos and galbanum resin is about six kilos so this just gives you an idea this is how much raw materials you need so you can see why neroli and rose are so expensive <laughs> because can you imagine 700 kgs of rose petals now a thousand kgs of bergamot of the actual bergamot now how many do you think that you need for that i'm not quite sure but because bergamot they're heavy aren't they but if you look at neroli flour I mean, how light is an aroli flower? And then imagine you need 1,000 kilos of it. So that's a lot of flowers to be able, it's like weighing feathers, you know? So now you can understand why some oils are so much more expensive than others. We're going to look at intensity now. We've almost finished this lesson. So let's have a look at intensity. People often ask, what is, what, what's the intensity? What does cologne mean? What does parfum mean? What does eau de toilette? And what it means is basically, if you look at this, one of the lightest ones is um, cologne or eau de cologne. 
Um, and this is 3 to 5%. What you mean by 3 to 5% is if you have a 100ml bottle of perfume, about 3 to 5 mLs will be the actual pure blend, the pure perfume blend, the oils, and the rest of it will be alcohol and maybe conditioning agents and fixatives. So if you look at a 100ml bottle, that's about 3 to 5 mLs, 3 to 5%. The Eau de Toilette is slightly stronger at a 5 to 8% and it's one of the most popular intensities of perfumes um, worldwide. And then you'll look at the Eau de Parfum which is 8 to 15%. A lot of people think it's a lot stronger but it's not. Uh, yeah, so a per perfume will be 8 to 15%. It can go a little bit higher if you're keeping it in alcohol, but if you look at an extra de parfum, it's normally 15 to 30%. And an extra de parfum, a lot of the times um, when it is about 30%, some of them even go up to 50%, you know. And if they do, then often they will put them in an oil. So if it's in an oil base, I have a Dior, J'adore by Dior, and I have that, and that's in an oil base, and that's not meant to be splashed all over your body and sprayed all over like you can with a perfume or a toilette or a cologne. With an extra de parfum, you should just be putting it on your pulse points. Now we're going to be looking at just setting up your workspace. So it's really important when you set up your workspace to start smelling and experimenting that you consider the following factors. It's just really important and it's quite basic, but you need to know, you need to work in a very well ventilated area. I mean, this makes common sense because if you're going to be stuck in a place where there's no air, there's no window, there's no ventilation, even just a fan or AC, you know, is going to make a bit of a difference. Open a window. If you're in a country, unlike Dubai in the summer, we can't open the windows here because it's too hot. But I'll always make sure that I have the AC or a fan um, and a door open in the lab. It needs to be well ventilated, otherwise you're going to get dizzy. Trust me, working with oils for quite a long time. So make sure that your workspace is very well ventilated. Work in a smell-free zone. And what I mean by this is don't have anything there that's going to interfere with your sense of smell. So don't have fresh flowers in there. Don't have a coffee pot in there. Uh, you, it must be so neutral with the smells so that it doesn't interfere with whatever materials it is that you're working with and confuse you. And of course you need to work on a stable flat surface, don't work on a table that's got, got wobbly legs or something like that. You know, you need to make sure that it's on a stable flat surface to avoid spillage. And create a perfume as organ. In one of my videos when we talk about weighing, I'm going to have a, um, what, a, a show you an organ that my husband actually made for me out of wood and then painted it gold. They're absolutely beautiful. So you can do that or you can just have it on shelves. It's entirely up to you. But yeah, it's um, you can and if you just go on the internet and have a look at typical perfumers organs um, and it depends how many oils that you have. You might have hundreds and hundreds of them. So therefore you will need a larger organ and how you display it as well, how you organize it. You can separate the organ into families, you can separate it into notes or you can separate it alphabetically. So it's entirely up to you but as long as you have your own system then you know how to work and then it makes it easier for you to be able to find those oils, especially if you've got 500 oils and you need to go and find um, lemon oil, you know, how do you know where to find it? Will it be in a family? Will it be in a top note or will it be alphabetical? So make sure that that's really organized so it's easier for you to be able to get to and reach your oils. Keep your oils very handy, like I said, and put them on the organ or however it is that you store them, but store them in a way that they're not in direct heat. So don't put them near a window where, where this, or in a room where the sun is going to be shining through the window and it's going to be damaging them, even if they're in dark bottles, which is one of the best ways to actually store your oils, is in a dark uh, green, blue, black, amber, glass bottles. You can keep them handy in those bottles, but even if you get sun shining through the window, the heat is going to uh, destroy it um, and just make the shelf life uh, quite less than it should be, really. So cut, put, cut them in a dark place 
or quite a dark place. If you don't have any dark bottles, put some great big labels around the bottle or something like that to protect it from the light. And have a filing system as well. If you're going to have a Rolodex or you've got some files and things like that, uh, put them on shelves, clearly label them so that you can find things. I used to be so disorganized when I first started out and I would have about six different recipe books and then I would write it on a post-it note. Then I would lose the post-it note or I would find it like a year later and it was somewhere else stuck in another book. You know, so right from the get-go, get organized, get yourself a Rolodex, get yourself a filing system, get a lever arch file, put everything in an A to Z file, things like that with dividers. I really do believe in this and it'll make your life so much easier because, you know, for a couple of years I was just going, which book is it in? I can't find that recipe. So it's really important to get really organized. Learn from my mistakes, please. Like I said, be organized. You have to be and get boxes and things like that with labels on. Get yourself a label maker even. Make it fun and keep your equipment to hand. So have glasses with your pipettes in, have a glass or even I use beautiful jugs in one of my videos. I'll show you um, in my little cabinet that I have and I use vintage jugs to put my pipettes in. It just makes it more fun um, and I keep my paper strips in there. So whatever equipment it is that you've got and your scales, um, you know, any kind of equipment that you have, pens um, and pads, keep it to hand and keep it handy and keep it organized. A waste bin. I mean, it sounds so simple, but you need to have a waste bin in your workspace because otherwise you'll be running from one room to another and then you might lose your concentration. So keep it always handy. Even use like a little, I use little gold bins that I get from Ikea, actually. Uh, they are actually plant pot holders uh, because they're very small and cute and that's what I use as waste bins and I can have it actually on top of my workspace. Make sure that you always have pens and your own record system, like I said before, whatever you choose, if you choose a journal, if you choose a lever arch file, if you choose a proper filing system with a big filing cabinet or just something simple as a Rolodex, but as long as you're comfortable with your own recording system for experiments, then that's all you need. Very quickly, we're going to end with safety. Never apply knee oils directly to the skin. This goes without saying, if you're going to be working with neat oils, use some gloves. It can cause irritation or little rashes and you know, you don't want that. When we're working with diluted oils through the modules, you won't need to wear, gla um, you won't need to wear gloves at all actually, but when they're neat, wear gloves. Avoid splashes, well, that goes without saying, if you've got some beautiful clothes on, it can cause stains on your clothes. Use paper strips to smell and not directly from the bottle. Why? Because if you're smelling directly from the bottle, the first thing you're going to be smelling is because we're going to be diluting them. The first thing you're going to be smelling is alcohol. And then you'll be like, oh, it smells like alcohol. Yeah, of course it does because you've not given it time to evaporate. So that's why you have to use the paper strips. I'll be giving you smelling techniques in the next module. In the next lesson, sorry. When working with neat oils, yes, dis wear disposable medical powderless gloves. I've already mentioned that. If you do get oils on your skin, wash the area immediately. Please try not to get it into your eyes. That's why you need to be careful when working with oils. Work diligently, but uh, do seek medical help if you get oils into your eyes. And never rush. I've had people in my classes that are rushing because they get too excited while they're working and invariably it leads to accidents and they spill some very, very expensive oils. And take regular breaks as well. It's very important to take regular breaks when you're working with oils. If you continuously smell for hours and hours and hours on end, you're going to get nose fatigue and you can get dizzy and you might get a headache as well. So take regular breaks. And that's it. That's the end of lesson one, module one. Join me for the next lesson.